future happening, like the kids in care coming home. There's been such a generational trauma with starting this federal um, residential school policy and then provincial um, child welfare policy to say that this family, this community, this culture is not good enough to look after these children. So you scoop them out and uh, put them in non-Aboriginal homes in a culture they can't relate to. And it's it's very traumatic. It would be great just to, just to have them know that they are home. lifestyle is all different. They probably only have the clothes that they have on their bodies. That's why I say, what would you say if that child came up to you and said, can I come home with you? There's a lot of things that we can do as people, as Aboriginal people. The reason we're using cultural permanence here is because it's kind of becoming a buzzword. So MCFD now has adopted that as part of their new kind of adoption agenda. Um, and it's used in other provinces as well. A lot of people have written about custom adoption in terms of a lot of research itself. Um, it's limited. We, we still have to do a lot. And I'm so glad to hear that, you know, um, you're you're doing some record keeping in terms of your processes and how you're, you're moving forward with this. Um, because our knowledge, as you know, was transferred for, from our elders. And so we have the stories, we have uh, teachings, but in terms of things written down, there's, there's not a whole lot. But it seems that people agree that custom adoption, um, one of the key features of it was that there was no uh, boundaries or limitations or secrets that are often found uh, historically in ministry-led adoptions. Certainly, we're now uh, hearing about, you know, from survivors of the 60s scoop, um, there's a class action suit in Ontario that's just been uh, approved by the courts, and uh, they're calling all uh, uh, adults who have been foster children or adoptees in the province of Ontario uh, to be part of this class action suit, much like the residential school um, hearings and, uh, and process. So if you know anyone who was in foster care or adopted in Ontario and it's First Nation, Métis or Inuit, uh, they're, they're, they're setting up a process to um, look at how, how to reconcile that. 
because learning about custom adoption, I think, is where we want to go. Because um, I have such difficult time with children and youth who, by they turn 19 and they're still in our care. Um, I don't think that's right, and and we need to be more proactive at looking at family members and community members so that they're they're not turning 19 in care. Probably you know that now there's. Um, legislation saying that a an Aboriginal child in care is supposed to have a cultural plan, but sometimes they're written down on a paper, um, they're put in the child's file, and then they're forgotten about it. How do we support children, first of all, as they grow? What are your customary laws when that child grows, you know, when they hit puberty, when they begin to grow into a young person? That cultural plan needs to be revisited. The second piece that we heard about is bringing in the foster family or the caregivers, um, the kins who are taking care of that child. How do we bring them into a cultural plan for that child? How do we support them in attending events, uh, in working with an agency, in working with the knowledge holders in the community? And then the third one that we heard a lot about is poverty. How much of a barrier that is to having First Nations, foster parents, and adoptive parents. People talked about, you know, yes, it's part of my traditions to do it, but I, I just, I'm stretched out. I have relatives, you know, staying on my couch. I have nieces and nephews crashing at my house. I don't have that extra bedroom to be approved. And we heard a lot about the barriers um, involved in custom adoption and taking on children. I think definitely one of the biggest barriers that we have is the relationship building um, between our agency and the communities as well as the Ministry of Children and Family Development um, because I think that by the time they come to us it's already too late because what happens is whenever children are in care with the ministry they're in care under a temporary custody order and then by the time they come to NIFCIS, they're continuing custody. And sometimes that takes two years, sometimes that takes four years and or longer. And they're stuck in these transition periods where they're getting further and further lost from, from their community and their families. And so I think that, one, that should be a sooner. We should, we should be a part of their lives much sooner than that. What I've noticed over the years is our youth and young adults are, there is a weird, weird concept called a throwaway. Youth are throwaways, you know? And, and when I hear Aboriginal people themselves say, well, if you live under my house, my rules, if you don't like it, get out. And that's it. We're not like that. We're an extended family system. If we're having problems with our kids, we have aunties, uncles, you know, family that could step in and help because we're not nuclear, a nuclear family, liberal ideology people. We're tribal people. We can't live any differently and our children cannot survive unless we stay true to who we are. When we had the homecoming for the children that were on in, uh, the, uh, in the system and they'd say, I want to come home. I want to come to this place. I want to know how to live. I said, are you ready? None of them, they, most of them said, no, we're not ready yet. Because of their difficult situation being removed from their parents and family and culture and community, and have to move around and from foster care to foster care, some of these children sometimes develop problematic behaviors. And sometimes it's difficult for caregivers and people who interact with them to see their beauty and their nobility. It's really hard when you first get into foster care for the first year or two that me and my brother were in foster care. I remember telling him that our mom was going to go us back. But after four years of being in foster care, I stopped telling him that. But um, 
As soon as I stopped telling him that, it was easier because we knew it just wasn't going to happen. And so we focused more on school or family and friends and just making life wherever we were put. I think the one person that helped me the most throughout everything was my younger brother. We moved from town to town, home to home, and we changed schools a lot. And until we got used to the home that we were in or the school that we started going to, we pretty much only had each other. Now there's my son that helped me. He really helped me motiv get motivated again to go back to high school. And I'm graduating this year now. You're here and you're spending time with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's important that you're here and it reminds us of the work that we're doing. Truth-telling, we share and describe our traditional ways and our traditional culture, as you can see. And by practicing our culture in a positive way, which includes the singing and the drumming and dancing and wearing our gear, we show where we come from and who we belong to. And we show our traditional songs and share our traditional songs and dance. And that connects us to one another. And the drum, as you hear the drum beat, you listen to the drum, and it's like it is a heartbeat, and it is like a heartbeat of your nation. Someday we will be walking together as one, but right now we're not there yet because we still have a lot of challenges that we're faced with that we have to walk through. I remember long ago, when I was young, the children were young. They were walking the streets all hours of the night. And I was going down my boat to go up trolling. And there at the bottom of the hill, I never forget the look of those children. We got nowhere to go. We got to do something. They were pleading, pleading for their lives. At that time, I was young, and I didn't, didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say, but I just stand beside them. Uh, I wish I had more hands with them to let them know that we are here, all of us elders. If you can do that, see them. Grab a hold of their hands and work in a circle. Maybe sing a little song. Things will work out if you do. It. All they need to do is hear a song. Just like the birds in, in the springtime, all they hear is the birds, they sing a song. So, help your children. Really look after them. They are, they are the ones that will help our other children that's going to be roaming the streets. Grandparents, parents, aunts, and uncles are here to support children and families, work with their children in real to encourage them to complete their education, share pride in who and what they are, where they come from, to teach them about their culture, who they belong to, their nation, tribe, crest, clan, family, to help work towards and develop strong self-care plans and safety plans so their children feel safe, and parents as well. And here to be mentors and role models and helpers and teachers. 
We have to remember that our children will learn what we do, how we treat others and all those around us. If we want to move in the direction of change, we have to be aware how we are seen. <coughs> we all have been affected by or have experienced the trauma of attending residential school. We have all been hurt by the past, but if we remain stuck in the past, we as people will not be able to move forward. With the kids that I had, they were not put in my hands by welfare. I had my brother, my brother's son for three months. And when he brought him home, I was at work. Go home, this little boy running around in my house, and I said, what are you doing? <laughs> Your uncle dropped him off. You're going to keep him. He's good enough to you. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do with him working? Well, he said, you can have him. Okay, then I'll have him. <laughs> so I had this little guy three months looking after him. And same thing, I go to work come home, my baby's gone. So where's the baby? Oh, uncle came back and picked him up. He took him home. I mean, his wife doing good again. Oh, my goodness. I guess I look like somebody that's supposed to look after kids all their life. I say this word here in our language. We say mehodihi. And about, uh, I don't know, maybe five years ago, six, ten years ago, something like that, we had an opening at UBC, and uh, uh, there was a telephone exhibit. And an elder, he passed on now, his name was Robert Kwok, he was from Miskit Lake, and he, he used that word, mehodihi. It says, our way of life, and the way we are. And that's what we've been talking about here for the past two days now. Right? And to come back to that, I see that in us. We all come back to who we are as a people. Mm -hmm. Come back to regain our identity, the dignity, and all that. And, and I see everybody here, we hear the laughter, we hear them speak, and I hear you guys speak with that, with that dignity. And oh, it's, and you know, it touches me. As workers, one thing that, that could benefit us greatly is the groups such as the grandmothers group, um, or the child and family teams, and so that we have those connections and we're able to find out who are all the families that are connected to this person. Um, so we're not looking at the 30, 30 moves. The enormity of the problems that families face, it is not just one thing so you can go and fix it quickly. It is something that is so intergenerational and has historical roots to it. And just as history influenced the present, so we have a complexity that needs a complexity of solutions to keep children in their homes. So, um, and it needs people from all levels to work together. It is a myth to think that all that needs to fix the problem is for families to get better. It's just not going to happen that way. We have a trend where the majority of the families are Aboriginal families and that trend tells a story about the historic roots that is partly responsible for some of the current problems. So we need um, government at all levels, we also need the cultural strength from within the communities, we also need um, everybody coming together and sitting down, identifying the problems, and everybody coming up with some solutions. We need to build our relationships so that, that when we're working with children and youth, we can easily access who are the family members, what are um, the family events that are going on, not just there's this feast going on once a year, or, or there's this welcome home ceremony once a year. We need to be involved for the whole life. Getting our kids out of the, the system and bringing them home and teaching them 
about our ways and our customs, traditions, and letting them know that they're our family at home, that care for them, and we would bring them home because we don't want to lose them in the system, in the city life, uh, into drugs and alcohol or whatever. When you create awareness and you create um, better understanding of together of what the problems are and identifying them and then coming up with solutions. So we need to have more of this kind of um, social dialogue on a very personal and also on a research basis which the university did bring to to this forum. Chris Tate, who's a youth, former youth in care, he was one of our keynotes. All my former foster kids better ride because they say the hope for my future has died. But you're wrong, haha, ha, it's still alive. So whoever is holding my case file, they better hide because I'm living proof that real love can never die. Right on, right? <laughs> That's what I really am, and all I want to be. It may take some time, it may be hard to find, but see me beautiful.